Swift Show starts right now. Damn it! What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airwaves of ESPN Radio and ESPN News, 250 plus markets across the United States of America. Check your AM FM listing nearest you, plus ESPN Radio on Sirius XM Channel 80, plus ESPN Radio simulcast over the live national television airwaves of ESPN News. Number to call up as always is triple eight say ESPN. That's eight 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 seven two nine. 3776. The Stephen A. Smith Show is being brought to you by Credit Karma. Get your truly free credit scores with free credit monitoring from Credit Karma today. That's Credit Karma, K A R M A. Hey, get knowing. Time for Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. I don't know what the hell is going on. I don't know what to say. I don't know what the hell to say today. And I'm talking about the New York Giants. New York Jets are a different story. Because Le'Veon Bell is a member of Gang Green. At least he will be officially, is expected to be officially as of 4 p.m. this afternoon. The New York Giants, however, have decided to trade Odell Beckham Jr. to the Cleveland Browns for a first-round pick, a third-round pick, and safety Jabril Peppers out of Michigan entering his third year, which, by the way, Peppers can play. He's not Landon Collins, but he is younger, cheaper. Chances are potentially a greater upside, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I got to admit, I got to admit to you, I'm taken aback by the New York Giants' decision to trade Odell Beckham Jr. First of all, I expected him to get more, and secondly, I don't like the fact that he's gone, but Eli's still here. I don't like the fact that Odell Beckham Jr. is gone, but Pat Sherman's still here. I don't like the fact that Odell Beckham Jr. is gone, but Dave Gettleman is still here. But I'll get into all of that a little bit later because I wanted to bring on my next guest, and I'm being told that he's with me right now. He is a host on 98.7 FM ESPN New York, 10 to 1 p.m. every weekday. He does football analysis for FS1. He is not good. He's great. He's outstanding. And damn it, we should monopolize this man. I'm talking about the great Chris Ganty, former Super Bowl champion with the New York Giants, right here with George Truly. What's going on, man? How are you? Man, I can't call it Stephen A. Still trying to figure out exactly what the Giants are doing, but a busy day in New York sports, no doubt, with uh, the Giants trading Odell and then, of course, the Jets landing Le'Veon Bell. Well, let me tell you something right now. I, I, I'm the one that needs to be confused, not you. You know your damn football, okay? I don't need you <laughs> confused. I need you to break this down for me because i got to admit to you, Chris, I'm at a loss here. When you decide to let go of Odell Beckham Jr., first things first, why do you think this happened? Why do you think Gettleman made this move? Well, it's a couple of different things, Stephen A. First of all, I think that this is ownership allowing Dave Gettleman and Pat Shermer to move on from Beckham. I think it was clear that Beckham wasn't a Pat Shermer guy. We saw earlier in the season last year he did the sit-down interview with Josina Anderson, and it was kind of weird because he had Little Wayne there too. Yep. But then you heard the criticism that Odell had uh, of Pat Shermer and the play calling in the second half of that Philadelphia Eagles game down in the link. That's probably not a good look for your first-year head coach. And then, of course, the optics behind Odell Beckham Jr. not diving on that ball on the onside kick in the Chicago Bears game at the end of regulation. Those are all things that you would think that Pat Shermer would be frustrated with. And so the fact that the Giants are eating as much dead money that, as they're eating in 2019, $16.5 million they're eating in dead money, when they trade Odell Beckham Jr., I think that just signals that ownership is on board with the direction that Pat Shermer and Dave Gettleman are going down. And I think this signals that the Giants are in full rebuild mode. And I guess what I'm asking is this. Is it justification for the New York Giants, mainly their ownership? I do understand the notion of you allocate responsibility to subordinates. You've got to let them do their job. The great George Bodenheimer once told me that. you got to let your subordinates do the job that you hired them to do. I understand that notion. The flip side to it is that 
Pat Sherman didn't have a winning record. He certainly didn't have a stellar reputation as a head coach coming in and getting the job, job from the New York Giants. And we know how ultimately, even though the Carolina Panthers were guided to a Super Bowl appearance by Gettleman, there were a lot of things he left to be desired before he departed from Carolina. So considering the questionable history of both of those guys, shouldn't that have been taken into consideration before allowing them to unload a talent like Odell Beckham Jr.? Well, I mean, ownership was on board with hiring those guys because those guys were going to allow ownership to have some level of influence in terms of developing the plan for 2018. Like, I mean, the decision that you passed on a quarterback at two last year and drafted a running back, the only reason that the franchise would do that is because they already thought they had a quarterback in Eli Manning. But in all of this, I think the hierarchy of the Giants, they were wrong in their evaluation in terms of what that team would be able to accomplish in 2018. And missing on that evaluation is what put them in the situation where they were forced to make a hard decision on Odell Beckham Jr. But that's why the Giants are here where they're at right now. And I think that based on the decision to trade Beckham, ownership has got to be on board with what Dave Gettleman and Pat Shermer want to do. Dave Gettleman and Pat Shermer didn't give ringing endorsements of Odell Beckham Jr., but they understood that ownership wanted Odell around. They gave him the contract extension. They thought that he would be in line with what, what they wanted to do in terms of establishing an agenda. It just didn't work out that way, and I think that's why they shipped him to Cleveland. But what evidence do they have that he wasn't in line with what they wanted to do, Chris? Because to me, having antics on the field or doing a sit-down interview with Josina and basically, you know, talking about that sometimes you're frustrated or whatever and you want to win. Or outside of that, throwing your helmet into a net or engaging in some on-field antics from time to time that didn't really cost him anything. It's not like the guy didn't show up to practice. It's not like he didn't show up on Sundays. It's not like it was his fault that Eli Manning would either underthrow or overthrow passes to him all the damn time. What evidence can they point to in your mind that justifies this feeling of disgust, like this guy is not good for our team? I understand you got to take a Tylenol every now and then because of a headache that he could give you in a particular summer. But the way folks talk about Odell Beckham Jr., you would think the guy went AWOL like Antonio Brown purportedly did at the end of the season, for crying out loud. And that hasn't been the case. Well, Stephen, you know as well as I do, when you're getting paid the kind of money that Beckham was getting paid on that contract extension, you're getting paid for more than just your production on the field. Like, That's you have true. to be an extension of the hierarchy in the organization and of ownership, not only in the locker room, not only on the field, but in the community. And I think with a couple of things, it's clear that Odell Beckham Jr. questioned the authority in the Giants organization. And I think that's fair to do, because the fact is they had 50 losses over his tenure as a New York Giant, 50. So, mm. I mean, that, that, that speaks for itself in terms of what the Giants hierarchy has been doing in trying to feel the competitive team. But they've been... They've been wrong in terms of what they could accomplish, and some of the moves that they made last year didn't quite work out. The Nate Solder move is something to be questioned. Signing Patrick Omame, that was a bad decision. You cut him before the end of the season. Like, you're looking at some of the things that have been done in the last calendar year, and I think it's fair to question the Giants' plan. But I think moving forward now, you're out of this stage where you're half pregnant as an organization. Are the Giants going for it? Are they rebuilding? We didn't know. We were in this gray area. I think it's clear now that the Giants are in rebuilding mode. And I think this trade can be judged as a winning trade if and only if Dave Gettleman uses the capital that he got in return to somehow parlay that into the Giants landing but, their future franchise quarterback. But before we move forward, Chris Canty, let's stay in the moment where we are in terms of really dissecting rationales and reasons behind why this trade took place. Let's look at it from the perspective of a Saquon Barkley. There is no question that Saquon Barkley is a stud. There is no question that he is a talent worthy of being picked number two overall like he was last year. There is no question that Odell Beckham Jr. and him had a really good relationship. But is it possible that one of the frustrations that Odell Beckham Jr. may have had was, there, was in their willingness to pick a Saquon Barkley as opposed to prioritizing changing a quarterback position from Eli Manning to somebody else that could actually throw him the football. Well, listen, I'm sure that that was a part of the frustration, and you saw glimpses of that in that interview that he did with Josina because Josina asked him a very pointed question. She said, do you believe in Eli Manning as the quarterback of this team moving forward? And Odell Beckham Jr. gave a half-hearted answer. In that type of situation, if you're the face of the franchise, wide receiver getting paid that much money, anything else other than him coming out and saying yes was saying that he wasn't sold on Eli Manning. And I think that's the case. But if you're the New York football giants, you knew going into last year's draft, 
that it was going to be a decision on whether or not you were going to take a quarterback or whether you were going to take a running back. You decided to take Saquon Barkley, and you ended up rolling with Eli Manning again. So I think that it's a situation now where you realize one of those stars that you had on offense, either Beckham or Barkley, was going to come at the expense of being able to have a quarterback. That's it. That's what it comes down to. Chris Canty right here with Stephen A., ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Dissect Eli Manning for me. We watched him last year. Believe it or not, he had a better completion percentage last year than at any point in time in his career. He completed over 66% of his passes last year, and he never had done that in the, throughout his entire career with the New York Giants. But we all know what our eyes are telling us, that he's not very good any longer. You played for this team. He was your quarterback at one time. I know that you know football. Dissect for us what we have been seeing from Eli Manning and whether or not there was any justification whatsoever in Odell Beckham Jr. giving something less than a 100% endorsement of him. Well, here it is, Stephen A. I mean, Eli Manning has a diminishing skill set, and that's what you would expect for a 38-year-old quarterback, especially when the organization for the better part of this decade hasn't put the right protection around him. That offensive line has been a mess since Super Bowl 46, and they've juggled to try to fig figure it out, and it still hasn't worked out. And so you had four new starters from the group that started in 2017 to the group that started in 2018, and it still didn't begin to play better until after week eight. And so I look at that and I say Eli Manning is not capable of overcoming the deficiencies that they have on the offensive side of the ball and deficiencies overall on the roster. And when you're paying a quarterback that kind of money and he can't be a force multiplier, then you're going to find yourself in a bad way as a franchise. Dave Gettleman talked about not being in quarterback hell. But that's exactly where he's found himself at right now. And this team is not going to get to a point where they're consistently competitive until they get real about trying to find the next franchise quarterback. So with that being said, Chris Canty, why is Eli Manning still a quarterback of the New York Giants in your estimation? The answer seems obvious, but I think it's important for somebody that's a former teammate of this that played for the organization to let our listeners know. Why is he still the quarterback for the New York Giants? Well, it's a couple of things. First of all, I just think there's a level of respect from ownership toward Eli Manning because the guy was an integral part in putting two more trophies in the trophy case. Right. So, I mean, he, he was uh, Super Bowl MVP in 42 and Super Bowl MVP in 46. And he's so, class personified. And he's he's class absolutely personified. I mean, nice In guy. terms of representing, representing himself as an athlete in New York City, I mean, the only person that you would put in terms of doing it at that level would be Derek Jeter. So, I mean, you have to respect what Eli Manning has meant to this organization for the last decade and a half. So, I think that's a part of it. Also, the ties that... Eli Manning has to ownership because, I mean, Eli Manning is the last link in that Ernie Corsi wellington Mara era of Giants football. So there's a little bit of the human element and emotional attachment in that regard. But I think the biggest reason why Eli Manning is still on this team and accounting for a $23 million cap hit in 2019 where you're cutting payroll everywhere else is because you're going to want Eli Manning to be around to mentor the young quarterback. Again, I go back to saying the only way that this Odell Beckham Jr. trade makes sense is if you use the capital to parlay that into putting yourself in position to get the but next Chris, franchise quarterback. But, Chris, can you trust Eli to do that? Because remember a couple of years ago when McAdoo, Mr. Pudgy, Pat Riley wannabe with the slick back hair in the shades, he didn't bench Eli Manning. He asked Eli Manning to play a half and let him bring somebody else in in the second half. And Eli Manning, at least according to the reports, refused to play. And obviously last year he played all 16 games. So I'm wondering how receptive Eli is going to be to be in that tutor, that mentor to the whoever the heir apparent is, which we assume will be Dwayne Haskins out of Ohio State, assuming that he lands at number six and the Giants get him. I got to look at it from that perspective, uh, Chris Canty, and wonder, can I trust Eli to be that guy? Well, listen, Eli Manning and his explanation on why he took the approach that he did when he was benched for Geno Smith, he said, listen, if you're going to go with Geno Smith or Davis Webb, Go ahead and let them be the starter for the entire week and get the lion's share of the reps. Because there's only so many reps to go around in the practice. And in order for one of those young kids to have their best chance at being able to go out and execute the game plan on Sunday, you want them to see the majority of the reps in practice. So from that standpoint, Eli's explanation does make sense. But in terms of what he would be willing to do if the Giants were indeed to draft the quarterback at the top of this year's draft, 
I, I think you have to look at what Dave Gettleman said at the combine and what he said at the end of the season regarding Eli. He said he had a no holds barred conversation with Eli Manning, and then at the combine he alluded to the Kansas City Chiefs model and what they did with Alex Smith mentoring Pat Mahomes. So I don't think that Dave Gettleman just threw that out there for no good reason. I think that gives you some insight into what he's thinking, but but, uh, but we won't definitively know until we see what they do on draft night. But is Dave Gettleman capable of having a no holds barred? hard conversation with Eli Manning considering the fact that his authority can easily be usurped by ownership because of their relationship with Eli Manning? Well, I think ownership is embarrassed about what happened in the last couple of years with the Giants, and they realized in doing what they did last year, they made a mistake. So the fact that ownership allowed Dave Gettleman and Pat Shermer to trade Beckham leads me to believe that ownership is going to give Dave Gettleman and Pat, Pat Shermer the autonomy to be able to do what they need to do. And if they think that the best plan is going ahead with Eli Manning and at some point Eli Manning giving way to the young quarterback at the middle of the end of this year, then I think ownership would be on board with that. Chris Canty right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Just a couple more questions before I let you get on out of here. The first and third round pick will materialize into what, in your estimation, for this upcoming draft? Well, I think anything less than in trying to find a franchise quarterback is unacceptable. Like, you have the sixth overall pick, you got the 17th overall pick, and you got a third-round pick. I mean, you have to think that you're going to use that capital to try to move up in the draft and put yourself in position to get one of those quarterbacks. Now, if you don't have a conviction on one of the guys this year, then trying to acquire future draft capital. But, I mean, anything less than finding the future franchise quarterback over the next couple of drafts based on what you did last night, would be unacceptable in my opinion. I'm worried that somebody is going to draft. I don't think that Kyler Murray is going to go past number one because of Kingsbury in Arizona. And I think when you look at, uh, you know, the Raiders at number four, I don't think that the Raiders, I, I think that the Raiders could ultimately look to nab a quarterback the likes of Dwayne Haskins if all, all possible, especially since you just acquired Antonio Brown. I'm of that mindset. Are you worried at all that Haskins isn't going to fall on number six like the Giants are hoping to? Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely worried about it. I mean, you look at the, the last several drafts. I mean, you've seen quarterbacks go 1-3 last. Quarterbacks comes off the board. You know that there are going to be other teams that are scrambling to move up to put themselves in position. And keep in mind, the San Francisco 49ers, they've given themselves a little bit of flexibility with their draft plan right. because we all knew they needed an edge rusher. One of the moves that went under the radar last night is that they traded a second-round pick to Kansas City for D. Ford, and mm -hmm. they paid him a five-year, $87.5 million contract extension. So, I mean, they have some flexibility to move back if they want to, and you know there are teams behind the Giants that are going to be looking to get up. Not only that, I'm also looking at, uh, listen, I'm looking at the four and fifth picks in the draft, the Raiders, because they're not sold on Derek Carr, right? I'm also looking at the Buccaneers. I know that you said Jameis Winston's your quarterback. I saw him in L.A. He looks in shape. Looks like he's going to be ready to go. We'll see. But the flip side to it is that clearly they were a better offense with Ryan Fitzpatrick. Don't just, if you doubt me, just ask Deshaun Jackson. They were a better offense with Ryan Fitzpatrick, but they made the decision to go with Jameis Winston. That could be fool's goal. They could be looking to draft a quarterback for the future as well. I can't put that past Bruce Arians. So to me, I'm looking at Tampa at five, the Raiders at four, as two teams that could potentially ruin the Giants' plans of acquiring Haskins, which means that the Giants would probably use the 17th pick along with the sixth pick to potentially move up or at least give up a third rounder and the number six overall pick to move up to ensure that they draft Haskins. To that, you say what? Well, I mean, it makes sense, right, Stephen A., because we all know there's going to be competition for the quarterbacks. I mean, there it's a quarterback league, and it's a quarterback star league. There's always a need. Four or five teams inevitably are looking for a quarterback in the NFL draft. And so, yeah, I think it makes sense for the Giants to try to package the sixth overall pick and the 17th overall pick and whatever else it would take to be able to move up to two. I mean, if you look at the draft trade value chart, the second overall pick is worth 2,600 points. The Giants pick at six is worth 1,600. The Cleveland Browns pick that they gave them in the Odell Beckham Jr. trade is worth 950. So you mm. can do the math and say, you know what? The Giants have a realistic possibility if they do want to move up to try to do some business with the number two overall pick. But again, it just becomes a matter of the Giants Dave Gettleman and Pat Shermer having a conviction on one of those quarterbacks to move up to do it. We know the Giants as an organization has done it in the past. It's exactly what they did with Eli Manning back in 2004. 
So we'll see what happens with that. But I, I, I got to believe that the organization made this move with trying to figure out who the next franchise quarterback is going to be in mind. Jabril Prep is going to do anything for the Giants, considering the fact that Landon Collins is gone and he's now there at the strong safety, at the strong safety spot? Yeah, I like Jabril Peppers. Okay. I, I like him. He's a local kid. I mean, he, he's going into... You know, his third year, and yeah, th there are some things that are left to be desired, but in terms of a skill set perspective, mm -hmm. he's comparable to Landon Collins. Again, not the playmaker that Landon Collins is yet, but the skill sets are comparable. He's a bot safety, and oh, by the way, he brings value as a returner as well. Plus, so he's, I, younger. I like it. I plus like he's it. Plus, he's younger and cheaper. He's two younger years and younger cheaper and cheaper. The, over the next two years, he's going to cost you $3.2 million. Mm. I mean, Le it's not the 11.2 that it would have took to franchise Landon Collins. Collins. That's right. Last question. Switching over to Gang Green and the Jets. They've acquired Le'Veon Bell. Your reaction to that? Well, I think they had to land this plane, right? This entire offseason has been about trying to support their young quarterback in Sam Donald. They've made some moves to fortify the defense. They brought in Adam Gase as the head coach to work specifically with Sam Donald. But I think when you look up, look at the makeup of the Jets roster, I mean, it's a team that's going to have to be led by their defense because that's where they have most of their significant investments, both in terms of cap space and in terms of draft capital. But, I mean, being able to add a playmaker that can take pressure off of your young quarterback like Le'Veon Bell, I mean, this is, this is a fantastic get for Mike McCagney. And guess what? Le'Veon Bell is going to complement what your team should do really well in 2019, which is play good defense. Ladies and gentlemen, I usually don't start off my show with any voice but my own, but you make exceptions when greatness is in front of you. And I'm talking about a great, great NFL analyst, the one and only Chris Canty, host 98.7 FM, New York City, Humpty and Canty, right here with Stephen A. Chris Canty, appreciate you, brother, as always. Thank you so much, my man. Thanks for having me on, Steve. All right, the one and only Chris Canty. And I mean what I say. I ain't lying. I ain't lying to anybody. This is one of the best analysts in America right now in the National Football League. Chris Canty is no joke. Listen to him on 98.7 FM in New York City every weekday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. on 98.7 FM in New York City. Plus, he's on television as well as FS1, but that ain't going to last long because I'm going to get him back here. This is the last thing I do. One of the best analysts in America. Make no mistake about it. Chris Canty right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. That was Straight Talk Wireless nationwide coverage in America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. You are listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Whole bunch of NFL stuff to go to. Mark Ingram's about to go to the Baltimore Ravens. Did you hear that news? Did you hear that? That's going on along with a host of other things to talk about in NFL circles. Don't touch that dial. Josina Anderson did an outstanding job reporting on the Giants and Odell Beckham Jr. She'll be on the start off hour number two as well. So make sure you don't touch that dial. Plus, I'm right here. I'm getting ready to get to the call because I want to hear how everybody feels about Le'Veon Bell in New York, about Odell Beckham Jr. going to Cleveland, about him leaving New York City, about Eli Manning still staying in New York City. The list goes on and on. Don't touch that dial. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. ESPN News, by the way, do you have freaking heartburn? Like the kind where you have an ass that's stashed everywhere in case it pops up. You know what I mean. You keep some in your bag or your desk or your car or your nightstand. You have those chalky tablets ready for whenever and wherever heartburn strikes. Well, listen up. There's an easier way to deal with your heartburn. That's Prilosec OTC. Just one pill a day will last a full 24 hours with zero heartburn. So kick your an acid habit, please. It's possible with Prilosec OTC. Use as directed for 14 days to treat frequent heartburn, not for immediate relief. Don't touch that dial. I'm just getting started. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Back with more in a minute. Learn what affects your credit scores and what you can do to improve them with Credit Karma. Maybe you need to dispute an error in your credit report or you're paying too much interest. Credit Karma can help with that. Visit CreditKarma.com or download the app now. That's CreditKarma.com. Got to err on the side of caution in terms of who to believe. It's easy to side with Russell Westbrook in this particular equation. It goes a step, a few steps further. The fan base in Utah, uh, uh, you know, Salt Lake City. Let, let, let's be very clear. There's history here. There's history of some issues, some problems that you've had in terms of the rabid fan base available to you all and how you react. We've also, and listen, it's the only game in town. You ain't got no football team. You ain't got no basketball team. You don't have that. You do not have that. Okay? And you got fans that come out there, and even though they're stringent with their rules about 
excessive alcohol use and security in Utah, from what I'm told, does an excellent job of really piping down on that stuff and making sure uh, they're relatively restrictive in the amount of alcohol people are consuming at these games. Nevertheless, sometimes alcohol is involved, but the rabid fan base that exists in Utah, Dennis Rodman, Allen Iverson, Russell Westbrook on numerous occasions, along with various other athletes, it can get ugly there. So this dude, this dude Shane Kaiser, stop lying. Just stop lying. You know, good and damn well, that ain't what you said, Aisha Nee. You said something else. Russell Westbrook and uh, Patrick Patterson, his teammate that was sitting right next to him, confirmed that what Russell Westbrook said was the absolute truth. Something along the lines, what was it, Nuno? Get on your knees like you've done in the past. Russell Westbrook absorbed that as racial overtones or undertones. He had a problem with it. And that wasn't the only thing that was said to him. And what he said, I've been in the league 11 years. I ain't in trouble. I don't bother anybody. It's true. Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. And you can always get in touch with the show through the 1-800-Flowers Twitter feed. This is my opening segment today. Go check it out on demand in the Stephen A. Smith Podcast brought to you by Capital One. Capital One is reimagining banking, offering accounts with no fees or minimums that can be opened in five minutes. Capital One, hey, what's in your wallet? 888-SAY-ESPN, it's 888-729-3776. Some interesting NFL news coming down the pike. Former Seahawks, Seattle Seahawks safety, Earl Thomas, all pro safety, intends to sign a four-year, $55 million contract with the Baltimore Ravens. A league source uh, told ESPN's Adam Schefter, I cannot express enough how happy I am for this man. According to the source, the deal includes $32 million in fully guaranteed dollars at signing. The deal includes $22 million coming in the first nine months. This is what Earl Thomas wanted. This is what he has deserved. I am incredibly happy for him. This is a guy that, that wanted to hold out but came on the field, and obviously he wanted guaranteed dollars because he was scared of getting hurt. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened to him. He got hurt when he gave the middle finger to the Seattle Seahawks who didn't take care of him, that wanted him to go out there without the guarantees. That's what ticked him off. I wouldn't have threw the middle finger at them, but I didn't blame him for his anger. But basically, the Baltimore Ravens got him, and, and, and they got a former Saints running back, Mark Ingram, who intends to sign a three-year, $15 million deal with the Ravens, a source told uh, our very own Adam Schefter and Diana Rossini. By the way, here's the deal. I don't know what the New Orleans Saints was thinking with signing Latavius Murray. I like Murray, but that four-year deal again, I don't know about that one. And I like the chemistry between Ingram and Kamara. Now, I know Ingram got himself suspended, got into a little trouble. I got all of that. But I like Ingram in New Orleans. It's going to be real interesting to see what he does for Baltimore. They're a rough and rugged franchise. And I'm telling you right now, that Earl Thomas essentially is replacing Eric Weddle. They still got to find a way to replace Suggs and a couple of other cats, Mosley and those boys, but... I like the Ravens. They didn't want to move. They didn't want to lose C.J. Mosley. They didn't want to lose him. Okay, but he ended up signing with the Jets, and now you've got a situation where hey, they replace him with Earl Thomas. That ain't bad. Not replace Mosley. I'm sorry, Weddle with with with, with Earl Thomas. They still got to replace Mosley, and they got they got to replace Suggs. Getting back to the New York Jets and the Giants. Listen, as it pertains to the Giants and Odell Beckham Jr., considering how dormant their situation is. I don't blame Odell Beckham Jr. Rather should be f happy that he's gone. Because all the Giants are going to do is lose again. And all he was going to do is elevate his level of frustration. Why bother? I don't believe in Gettleman. I don't believe in Shermer. I'm not knocking Shermer a as a football mind. I'm just saying that I don't, I don't consider him head coach in material. To me, he wasn't worthy of the head coach job. Maybe as a coordinator, but not the head coach job. In the case of Gettleman, Listen, God bless him because I know he's battled some health issues, battling cancer. 
as a person that lost my mom to that, I'm highly sensitive to that. And my prayers are with him every day. But I never appreciated the tail end of his job in Carolina when he let Josh Norman go and didn't have a backup plan. And I don't appreciate the job that he's done thus, thus far with the New York Giants. And somehow, some way, Mr. Mara and those boys have to get in line. Look, Eli Manning's got to go. Eli Manning is class personified. He's a good man. Highly professional, class personified, a two-time Super Bowl champion who should forever be revered by Giants fans and New Yorkers everywhere. He is class personified, but he's not what he used to be. And at some point in time, it's your time. Your time is up. And it's time for somebody else to come up in here. And I think that's incredibly important. And my God, I hope the Giants get Dwayne Haskins. I really do hope they get him. They'll need him. Because right now, all they've got is Saquon. There's nothing to brag on about. The way the Giants are looking on paper right now, they'll be lucky to win four games. As it pertains to the Cleveland Browns, on paper, you should win the AFC North. On paper, you should be a contender for the crown. On paper, with Miles Garrett anchoring your defense, you got Olivia, Olivia uh, Vernon, you could get to the quarterback. You know how I feel about Denzel Ward. He's a stud. I get it. Cleveland's doing some special things. And on offense, to have Baker Mayfield and to have Jarvis Landry and to add Odell Beckham Jr., and oh, by the way, a sleeper, Kareem Hunt is their new running back. He's on a commissioner's list. He's going to serve a, a suspension, you know, getting caught kicking a woman on camera. I think Kareem Hunt cost the Kansas City Chiefs the Super Bowl. But that's not an insult. That shows how good he is because I think he was that much of a difference. If Kansas City had Kareem Hunt, I believe Kansas City would have beat New England in the AFC Championship game, and I believe they would have beat the Los Angeles Rams in the Super Bowl. That's how much I feel or think of Kareem Hunt. So for him to be in Cleveland now with Nick Chubb, for them to have Odell Beckham Jr. and Jarvis Landry with Baker Mayfield throwing the football, you lost Zeitler on your offensive line, but I think that their offensive line, I got to trust that Dorsey knows what he's doing because he's done nothing to give us any other, any other kind of indication. Cleveland's going to make some noise, but I still got to see it to believe it. As it pertains to the New York Jets, let me say this about Le'Veon Bell. I'm happy for him that he's back in the league. The NFL is a better place when he's playing. I'm definitely happy for the New York Jets. McCagney did his job. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. McCagney did his job. But there is a flip side. And the flip side is this. Le'Veon Bell passed up on a $14.5 million franchise tag that the Steelers wanted him to sign. To play last year, he sat out the entire season, 2018. He did so because he said he wanted to establish a new market. He didn't want to be labeled just a running back. He was the second leading receiver the last time we saw him in the Pittsburgh Steelers uniform. 85 receptions, second to only Antonio Brown on the Steelers that year. He's a hybrid, and he wanted to be considered and judged as such, as opposed to being marginalized as a running back and paid accordingly. He didn't accomplish that here with this deal, netting him $35 million in guaranteed dollars from the New York Jets. He didn't get as much guaranteed dollars as Todd Gurley. He didn't blow up the market by averaging over $16 million a year as a multifaceted hybrid football player. So his goals were ultimately were not accomplished, even though he's getting paid. That much needs to be said. But I definitely think he helps the Jets exponentially. And it's going to be real interesting to see what they do this year. Let's get to the phone. Scott, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Hey, Stephen A., uh, long-time listener, first-time caller. Thank you. And Go I, I got to say, I, I really respect you, even though we don't always see eye to eye. <laughs> so, but, uh, a couple of I, months I, ago. Do you, do you really want to see eye to eye with a radio host? What fun is that? <laughs> you're absolutely right. You're Go absolutely ahead. right. Uh, a couple of months ago, back when uh, the Giants said they were keeping Eli, I wanted to call in and say, what if they are just waiting, not for Dwayne Haskins, but next year? I mean, can you see Tua or Trevor Lawrence? Maybe Here's my question. Giants? Here's my question. I have no problem with that wait-and-see approach if it's under normal circumstances. But the Giants have stunk long enough. 
How many more years? What is this, the process that was going on in Philadelphia with basketball? You want four- and five-year windows to stick up the joint before finally becoming respectable? I'm not down for that. I'm not down for that. If you didn't have picks and you didn't have a talent like Saquon Barkley, that would be different. But you do have Saquon Barkley. You had Odell Beckham Jr. You gave him up. You got a first-round pick, number six overall. You got a first-round pick, number 17 overall. You've got a third-round pick. Plus, you got Jabril Peppers. The fact of the matter is, is that do something with them. Haskins, how do you know there's going to be another? How do you know you're going to land a spot where you can get to him? Or you could get this kid Lawrence out of Clemson. How do you know you're going to have that luxury? You don't. You don't. You're so I'm going. Right. So yeah. if I know I could get Haskins, I'm going to grab Haskins. He's no scrub. The man threw 50 touchdowns last year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he's definitely no scrub. He's definitely no scrub. That's what I'm going to uh, do. Yeah, you're right. You're right. All right. Well, well thank you for Take it uh, easy. the call, man. Appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Leonardo, you're live with Stephen A. Go ahead. How you doing, Mr. Smith? My name is Leonard. I'm a long-time listener, first-time caller. Go ahead, Leonard. Yes, um, back to what Scott was saying. I understand your point, but so far as that, if he falls to the number six spot and they can grab him, I think they're going to grab him, but I do think they play is for next year. Who are you talking yeah. about, Haskins? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm sorry. I think they, the Giants play is for next year. You can whoever or – Cool. But, but my point is this. Who told you you're going to be able to get him? Unless you plan on throwing every game and going 1-15 and 15 or 0-16, oh how do you know you're going to get him? That's why they keep Eli, Mr. Smith. Yeah, but Eli still won your four games. Remember, Eli was there, played on 16 games last year, and you're sitting here saddled with the number six overall pick. They couldn't even lose right. How do you know you're going to get Lawrence at all? They don't. That's the, that's the whole chance so of gambling. But so, they're also so, going but, to acquire the pick. But Dude, why do it. that? Why do that if you have a number six overall pick? All right, let me ask you the question better this way real quick, and I need a quick answer. You have the number six overall pick. If you can, if you don't grab Haskins, who do you definitively grab that you know is going to make you better at number six? And I have the opportunity to get Haskins, I'm going to take Haskins. Okay, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Appreciate the call. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. You're listening live to Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. You know what never goes out of style? Surprising a friend or loved one will buy one, get one free multicolored rose bouquets for $29.99 from 1-800-Flowers.com. To order, go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ESPN. 888-SAY-ESPN is always the number to call. Got lots more to talk about with my callers before Joina's, Josina Anderson comes on the line. So don't touch that dial. You're listening live. To Stephen A, ESPN Radio, ESPN. How can anybody, I mean, choose a Minnesota over you. I mean, quality of life matters. And to Minnesotans out there, no disrespect. I'm quite sure the city's a beautiful city when the weather's warm. It's just that it's usually so damn cold. You are, All you see is, 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 is smog, fog, or whatever the hell, smoke, or whatever the hell it is out there. One of my best friends in the world is a guy by the name of Boris Terrell Battle. He and I went to Winston-Salem State together. He's not my friend. He's my brother. We're that type. I love him dearly. And his children live out there. And he's been living out there in Minnesota since he departed from school in the 90s. And every time I see him, I say, how could you do this to them? That's how cold it is in Minnesota. That really is how cold. I think wind chill factors and all of that stuff kept it. You know, what is it, like minus 50 one day a few a few weeks ago. Now, I understand they're playing in the Dome now. So life is different inside the football stadium. I get it. And if you want to look at it from another technical perspective, take into account the fact that the New York Jets were 4-12 last year on a course to nowhere, wondering where the hell they were going. The Minnesota Vikings had a down year as well, but their definition of a down year was 8-7-1 and one, following the 13-3 and three season and a trip to the NFC Championship game. This is a team that obviously with Kirk Cousins couldn't help them but so much. Their defense was ranked ninth, fourth in yards allowed, three against the pass. Your Anthony Barr makes perfect sense why you would want to stay in Minnesota with Coach Mike Zimmer. It makes complete and total sense why you would want to stay there. 
Does it look good for the Jets? Because they were about to demote or get rid of Darren Lee. Now you got to find something to do with him unless you got somebody else to go out there and target. So it's going to be really, really interesting to see what they do moving forward. Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the Stephen A. Smith Show appear via the Shell Pennzoil Performance Line. And you can always get in touch with the show through the 1-800-Flowers Twitter feed. Show. We're coming to you live from the Seaport District, South Street Seaport, at Pier 17, brought to you by Chase. Also, need seats to a game? Download the Vivid Seats app and enter promo code CHAMPS to check out to get 10% off your first order. Don't buy just any seat. Get a Vivid Seat. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Throughout the career of Eli Manning, do you know that according to Forbes magazine, as of this past January... Eli Manning was number two on the all-time list, being paid $235 million. $235 million. That was Eli Manning. Wow. Only Peyton Manning has gotten paid more, $248 million. Sometimes Eli just got to look in the mirror and be like, man, it's time for me to walk away. Patrick, real quick, you got 30 seconds. Go. All right, thank you. Uh, hey, Stephen A. Smith. So I just want to get down to the, to this giant situation. I'm okay. basically disgusted with this uh, with David Gettleman and what he's doing. Um, he let go of our best receiver, um, and I just don't think Dwayne Haskins is the guy that we're looking for. I don't know. He can't make plays with his feet. Um, we have a depleted line for the past couple of years. We've never found a solution to it. So. Do, do you think Dwayne Haskins is the answer to our problems? Well, listen, based on the system that they play, his ability to fling that football, um, they believe he is. He's ideal for this system, the way they like to play football. So if you take that into consideration, one would say yes. What I would tell you is here's the question mark. You're predicating whatever you assume his great, his level of greatness will be based on a system you've employed with Eli Manning over the past 16 years or so. That's my issue. You know, what's wrong with going in a different direction? What's wrong with getting something different from somebody else? I, I don't I, I don't understand that. But we'll talk about that as the show progresses today. Our number two is up next. Josina Anderson for ESPN on the NFL has been reporting on the NFL for the last several years. She's done an outstanding job. Uh, she interviewed Odell Beckham Jr. with Lil Wayne a little earlier this year. She's done a bevy of interviews that have been incredibly compelling, um, and few would know better than her what was in the mind of Odell Beckham Jr., what his feelings were, and probably how he's feeling today about being a member of the Cleveland Browns. We'll talk to Josina Anderson up next about that and so many more things percolating around the National Football League. Hour number two up next. We'll start off the hour with Josina Anderson, and then we'll get back to you and me. Hour number two up next. 